After many years in Germany, we decided to move to Israel, to a kibbutz in the Negev Desert. Now, don't worry, my travel channel is not going to turn into a personal vlog. My private life is quite boring and Israel is far more interesting. But I think that maybe through my story, you will be able to get a better understanding of life in Israel. Now, for me personally, to come back to Israel isn't such a big deal. Over the past seven years that we've been living in Berlin, I've often been back here. In summer, I would guide Israelis through Berlin, and in winter, I would try to fly to Israel to guide here as often as I could. I can basically summarize my life by saying that in summer, I talk about Hitler, and in winter, I talk about Jesus. Just kidding, Israel is more than just sites connected to Jesus, and Berlin is not only about Hitler. Now, anyway, moving the center of our life as a family is a big step. We had a good life in Berlin. Berlin is a green and comfortable city to live in. But as a family became bigger, we had to look for a bigger place to live. And we realized that we didn't just want a larger apartment for a good price. We were looking for a place to raise our family. Because we had great neighbors in Berlin and we had seen how important and helpful that was, we started to think about moving to a community where you know your neighbors and even better, you are friends with them, a place that we can feel a part of and not just a place where you rent an apartment and only say a quick hello to a neighbor whose name we don't even know. It was also clear to us that we wanted to leave the city and get closer to nature. One option was villages outside Berlin, but we didn't find what we were looking for, and so we started to think about moving to a kibbutz in Israel. Now, there is quite a difference between a village near Berlin and a kibbutz in Israel, but there is something very unique about villages and settlements in Israel. In Germany, as in most countries around the world, Villages are more um, conservative places, usually home to families that have lived in the same village raising pigs or, or wheat for generations. In Israel, it is different. Many of the pioneers who came to Israel at the beginning of the 20th century were young idealists who wanted to establish not only a Jewish state, but an utopian society. The new Jew, as they saw it, shouldn't live in the cities working a blue-collar job like the European Jews. Rather, they should be farmers and work the land. One of the creation of the young pioneers was the kibbutz. Now, I don't know how many of you know what a kibbutz is, and those who do know usually imagine the kibbutz 50 years ago. In short, in the beginning, it was like a communist village without the dictatorship part of it. There was no salary. No bosses and employees, all were equal. There was no private property. The houses were very small and they didn't have kitchens or rooms for children. Everybody ate in the communal dining room. And another idea, which may seem a little shocking today, was that children shouldn't grow up with their families, so they slept together in children's houses. The children only saw their parents for two, three hours a day in the afternoon. The idea was that the community should have a lot of influence over the children's education. When the first child was born in Ghana, the first kibbutz, the community decided they should choose a name for the newborn. The mother, by the way, wasn't against it. The idea was that it takes a village to raise a child, or in this case, a kibbutz. The whole community should take care of the children, and that also was the only way to allow women to be equal and work the same as men. Now, the kibbutz movement was very big in Israel throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s, but in the 70s, it started to fall apart. There are many reasons for that. The Israeli society had become more individualistic. The second and third generation didn't have the same socialist fires in their belly. And you know, why work hard if you could just get everything you need, housing, food, education, from the community? And it is also hard to succeed in the capitalist world when each and every worker is paid the same as the manager. 
about 70% of the kibbutzim, the im at the end is plural, um, went bankrupt and had to run themselves differently. Or in other words, they had to be privatized, which was a painful process for many. After all, it isn't easy to achieve so much, then have all that you believed in fall apart. So you might ask, if the ideas of the kibbutzim failed, then why do we want to move into one? First, many things have changed. Second, many of the good things have remained. One of the major things that has changed is that new members are independent. Nowadays, we can work in whichever field we want and keep our salary for ourselves. Formally, if you became a kibbutz member, you usually worked inside the kibbutz, in agriculture or in a factory. And if you worked outside the kibbutz, your salary went straight to the kibbutz. You were not allowed, for example, to own a car. The kibbutz had cars and you registered when you wanted to go somewhere. Now we keep our salary, we have our own car and we pay for everything, um, rent, kindergarten, after school activities and kibbutz taxes. One of my next videos will be about the living costs in Israel, which are much higher than in Berlin. Very painful video. If you find it interesting, then don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so you will be notified when I publish a new video. The kibbutz is a great place for children to grow up and most of the people who consider moving to a kibbutz are young families. The bad idea that children should only see their parents in the afternoon is long gone, but the community structure of the kibbutz is still there. The private houses are small, but the community areas are spacious and there are a lot of activities for the children. The kindergarten is like 200 meters away and the swimming pool is 300 meters away. It is a 10 minutes walk to the horses. There are no cars in the neighborhoods and almost no roads inside the kibbutz. You can tell the place itself is built for a community that spends a lot of time together just by looking at the map. See what a kibbutz looks like in comparison to a normal village. You can see that there are a lot more roads in a village, whereas in the kibbutz, the cars park outside the neighborhoods and bicycle paths run between the houses. Something that you can't see on the map is the recent increase in walls between the houses in villages. The village I grew up in is very wealthy, but when I was growing up, there were only fences, if any, between the houses. Today, the first thing that a lot of newcomers will do is build like a three meter, 10 foot wall around their property, and I just hate it. In the kibbutz, there are almost no walls between neighbors. So if it is so great, why don't all Israeli families move to a kibbutz? First of all, not everybody wants to live in a community. You are very close to your neighbors and some people don't, don't like it. You shouldn't live in a kibbutz if privacy is your priority. If I sit outside on the porch, talking on the phone or making a video, my neighbors are able to hear me. Politically, the kibbutz is left-leaning and secular. There are 270 kibbutzim, only about 15 of them are religious. Let's say it like this, Benjamin Netanyahu wouldn't be the prime minister of Israel if the decision were in the hands of the kibbutzim member. You also need to be accepted by the community. So once you moved in, you are put on a trial period of about um, a year, and you have to show that you have the financial capacity to build a house. There is also the geographical aspect. The kibbutzim in the center of Israel have long waiting lists, and they are mostly open to the children of the kibbutzim members themselves. So the Available option or lie on the periphery of Israel, up north in the Golan Heights and Upper Galilee, or in the Negev Desert. In both of these places, it is harder to get a job, and you earn less than you would in the center of Israel. For us, it was actually a good thing, because from the start, we always wanted a quieter, remote area, and I just love the desert. So that is basically what brought us here. And there is another thing that brought me back to Israel, something that is always on the background for me. As a tour guide, I get to be in remarkable places talking about remarkable events 
on a daily basis. And as a Jew who knows his history, I'm aware of that to be living in a time of a Jewish state is a blessing and I will never take it for granted. And I want to be a part of it. That's it. I hope you enjoy this video. See you in the next video. Yalla bye.